Alcoholics Anonymous is an offshoot of the Oxford Group Movement, which aspired to live by the teachings of Jesus Christ. In its infancy, AA split off and distinguished itself as a fellowship whose primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, and all are welcome, regardless of faith or creed. Though Christian in origin, the 12 steps were altered so as to make them acceptable to persons of any faith or no faith. Nowhere does the literature proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord Savior, and AA members are encouraged to find a higher power of their own understanding. My sponsor told me right up front, he said, you know, your higher power is yours to define. And what she said to me was, you need to find a God that you'd be willing to have coffee with. It doesn't have to be a body hung on a cross. You don't have to be a, a sitting Buddha. It, it takes out all the particulars. God is inside of you and inside of me. He's sitting right next to me. I understand God as love, life, truth. You know, people use um, omnipotence and awesome and, uh, you know, and those are all limited words to me. There is a God and I'm not it. <laughs> People that have a difficult time with the concept of God or concept of religion will use the love that they feel in the 12-step meeting rooms. God, as we understand them, you know, you have to ask yourself, do you understand yourself first? In 1935, in Akron, Ohio, one drunk helped another get sober, marking the beginning of AA. 73 years later, this fellowship has grown to a membership of nearly 2 million worldwide. What's come to be known as the Big Book of AA has been translated into over 50 languages. In addition, an estimated 550 other fellowships have patterned themselves after the same 12-step model to overcome every kind of addiction imaginable. This God's gift to the world, I like to think. It's the greatest contribution, spiritual contribution, to the Western world in the last 500 years. What was your initial reaction to the rooms of AA? They sucked. I thought they sucked. I hated them. And I didn't want anything, anything to do with it. I was more or less directed to go to meetings by um, doctors and social workers, and I would find the least little excuse so as I could walk out of the meeting. Like, it was weird to me. Weak, that was for weaklings, you know, the opiate of the masses, the whole Marx thing, religions for weaklings. What I'm going to say, I'm saying with love, but there are people who haven't been to temple in 30 years because they've been out drinking and they go, oh, I can't go in there, there's a cross on the wall. Come on, you know, get over it. I went and I heard people talk about God. I heard people talk about Christianity. And I heard people say the Lord's Prayer at the end of every meeting and hold hands while they're saying the Lord's Prayer, and it was like, I can't do this God thing because I don't relate to it, it doesn't make any sense to me, and I laughed. When you begin to say God to people, spirituality to people, the Bible to people, they immediately conjure up all kinds of bad religious experience. And those are just that, they're bad religious experiences. They're not experiences with God. I don't, I don't even think it's possible to have a bad experience with God. God is good, and he's always good, and God is love, and he's always love. Uh, but what we have done with that concept has often been really faulty and damaging. You know, they always say, yeah, we're made in the image of God. And so here I'm this little black kid, and it's kind of like the psychology of a black kid. They grow up, and, they, and when they're a little kid, they go to different churches. They go to a black church, and they look up, and there's a white man with long blonde hair, and he's God or he's Jesus. And he looks like Charleston Heston. And I'm like, I don't look like that. Something's not right, you know? You know, you get the real hardcore Christians, and, you know, you're going to hell if you don't have Jesus as a Savior. You know, the born again, the belt buckle wears, you know, we call them thumpers. And each of us has to work through the process of sifting those distortions of the divine. One of those that I refer to quickly is the Santa Claus image. Let me suggest the image with lyrics of a song. He's making a list, and he's checking it twice. Now, what's the purpose of the list? To find out if I'm naughty or nice. To think that by virtue of these lists, I will either receive merit or punishment 
is a distortion of the divine, and we need to let that go. I had developed over the years uh, some serious skepticism and cynicism about any kind of particular brand or flavor of God, you know. And I, I would say things to myself and to friends like, well, you know, they build these giant cathedrals, you know what those are for? Those are to catch God, because people are trying to trap God like you trap a butterfly in a, in a box, you know. We come in here, you know, confused, everybody, alcoholic or not, we're all confused, because from the minute we're born, we're given a name, may not fit. I may not like the name Fred, but I'm stuck with it. You know, uh, we're given a religion. I don't know anything about this religion, but all of a sudden now I'm a Catholic, a Jew, a Protestant, or whatever, and it doesn't fit. So, you know, part of the freedom of the program is, as they say, God, as you understand him, you get to go back and grow up again. You get to pick what you want your concept of a higher power, your belief system is. The 12 steps are fundamental truths. Fundamental truths are grounded in every religious tradition and no religious tradition. Yeah, after I looked at these 12 steps and I um, uh, read them, and uh, I began to realize, I thought, you know, they could have been crafted by a Hindu. All those points, 12 points, referred to in this book, Alcohol Anonymous, definitely be applicable to the Islamic faith. The 12 steps to me, I mean, I see them in Eastern and I see them in Native American spiritual practices. The 12 steps to me are God-inspired. Every step is promoting prayer. Every step. I mean, from the third step on back, it says, we ask, we ask, we ask, we ask, we ask, we ask. Well, who are you asking? You know, they're promoting prayer all the time. They say, I don't know how to pray. Well, then if you apply the steps to your life based as it is in that big book of alcohol, it's not miss. I bet you will. It says, ask him to turn your attention to what he would, how you do. That will be done. That will be done. You know, there are always, those 100 people promoted me to pray for everything that's happening to me. How do the 12 steps work in psychological terms? And, and it seems to me that it's about um, reflection, introspection, um, self-examination, um, recognizing where you've kind of screwed up in your life and where you've fallen down many times, making amends for that, which means to make changes in your life, not just apologize, but make some changes, and then continuing to make those changes. That's good psychology. You know, if you'd asked me when I came in, what are you willing to do to stay sober? My answer would have been nothing. If you ask me, what are you willing to do to stay drunk? An honest answer would have been, lose every member of my family, lose jobs, go to jail, lose every friend I had, and uh, lose every bit of self-respect. And I think at least one way of speaking about that is in terms of the very basic theological concept of idolatry. Uh, which is not simply worshiping a statue of a god or something like that, but it's pu putting something ahead of God, uh, putting having something else as one's prime concern, ultimate concern in life, rather than the true God. And if it is some chemical, uh, some behavior like gambling and so forth, then it's really playing the role of an idol for that person. First of all, I had no idea that you know, the drugs or, or drinking was the problem. That actually was what made me feel better, I thought, being in oblivion. That was nirvana. But it was, uh, it was a real realization coming to the fact that that's actually why I was in hell, is because of the drugs and alcohol. It was a mental thing. It was a spiritual thing. I, you couldn't have told me that. I wouldn't have believed it. My teacher, Rabbi Tversky, says what makes us human, what separates us from the apes, is not our thumbs, our pinkies, or the size of our brains. It's the fact that we have spirits. And what spirits are, are the part of us that wants more. And when we want more, we're able to think of God. And when we want more, we're able to drink to excess. <laughs> it's a two-edged sword. telling myself, am I telling myself that I'm a failure, that I'm never going to get this, that I'm powerless, that I just might as well surrender, or am I telling myself that I've had enough, I've got to do something about this, 
to say that I am powerless doesn't encourage me to do anything, doesn't make me a stronger person. Repeatedly saying to myself, I am powerless, I am powerless, I am powerless, makes me smaller and smaller and smaller. But in recognizing that I'm powerless, that can be very empowering. So it is, it's very paradoxical. I've, I've talked to psychiatrists who look at those steps and say, well, this is just, this is relinquishing my own internal power and saying there's an external locus of control. That's, you know, the psychobabble language that we use. Well, it's not about giving away my power. It's about recognizing that there's all this stuff outside that I cannot manage and I shouldn't even try. It's beyond me. What's within me that I can manage? So it's, it's recognizing the power that I have. On the left side of my bed, I had a pile of self-help books that was about a foot and a half high. And on the other side of my bed, I had a pile of self-help books that was about a foot and a half high. And on one top of one pile, I had a, a little mirror with, you know, with a, a straw and a razor blade on it, you know, for the coke and things like that. And on the other one, I had a little, a little uh, tray uh, with an ice bucket and, and, a, and a glass there and a bottle of vodka. So that's, you know, that was kind of my spirituality, to be honest with you. That's often the issue, is because they've been, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I can handle this by myself and I don't need anybody else. And well, then how come you're sitting at home drinking every night by yourself? So that, that disease of isolation is um, people are afraid of losing that autonomy they think they have and that sense of themselves as unique and special if they become part of a group like AA. A misnomer in Alcoholics Anonymous is self-help. I don't know where that came from. That is the farthest thing from that because that would imply that I would have some type of uh, power or control over something over me and that's the farthest thing it says lack of power was our dilemma there is one who's got all power that one is God I think the ego voice in you and me that voice that wants to ease God out of the conversation would say you know what if I admit that I'm powerless I lose control when uh, St. Augustine talked about original sin, when he talked about it as the idea of, of being curved in upon the self, uh, that uh, the idea that we put ourselves at the center of our life instead of God. If you're not your mind and you're not your body, and you do not know what to do and you're desperate, what's left? And so, I don't know, my Zen book says that the ego goes away long enough for light to pierce the soul. The idea, though, is a recognition we are not God. We are not infinite. You know, on the one hand, we are capable of this altruism, this this tri this this beauty of human nature that is that is divine. And on the other hand, we are periodically reminded of our ties to the stinking earth. We are going someday to die and rot. Dr. Tivo, who was Bill Wilson's psychiatrist for a time, you know, referred to Bill and other alcoholics as His Majesty the Baby. This is a very Freudian insight. Tebow was a Freudian. You think you're the center of the universe. How dare you do that to me? Because you come to find out that most people are not on a vendetta against you, and that's one of our ego traits as an alcoholic, is we think everybody's out to get us. And quite frankly, we're not that important to anybody else but us. <laughs> Yeah. This is the intriguing thing about human nature. There's something in us that tells us we're the center of the universe. We're made that way. But we're made to laugh at it. We're made to discover that we're not and, and to live juggling that, that truth. That in a certain sense, as far as our universe is concerned, yes, we are. I mean, their self-preservation is, is perhaps the first law of any existence. But self-preservation in a community, which, which means that we are not the center of the universe, uh, the center is not self. This is what this is why religion was invented, if you want, because letting people just be selfish was too destructive of everything. This is why what was invented? Religion. Oh. So it's like, okay, great, and you say, well, a lot of us could do that, whether you know, whether it's the meeting, AA, um, you know, nature. Uh, you know, the earth, the sea, the sun, uh, 
whatever you could consider a power that greater than yourself. Because God keeps me sober. It's only divine intervention. I'm an alcoholic. The only thing I know how to do is to escape out of here and go drink. That's what I know how to do. That's what the flesh, this animal, will do. You know, there's this idea with the God thing that uh, you can't do it. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you have no responsibility. Again, the tone is that uh, only God can save you from these things uh, because, uh, you know, essentially your own thinking, your own will, your own spirit is bad. It's, it's uh, not effective. It's not strong enough. I need something that's more powerful than everything, more powerful than, than the motorcycles, more powerful than the guns, more powerful than my testosterone overload or whatever it is that makes us men do the stupid stuff we do. You know? One of sometimes maybe the one thing that kept them from drinking or drugging was knowing that they'd have to come back into the room and tell everyone that they drank or used. Uh, the disease of alcoholism is a disease of perception. Um, I don't hear things right, and sometimes that causes me problems uh, with resentment, uh, self-pity, that kind of thing. And uh, that's why it's so important for me to have a group of people that I can run things by and get feedback. In sobriety, I've had some I've had some crises, I've had some things go on in me that were very tough that I could not shoulder alone, and I called upon my friends, and they show up, and I don't care if it's four o'clock in the morning. I the way I choose to think about it, would my God show up? Does my God show up at four o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe maybe that higher power that I believe in. Uh, is driving that car that's pulling up in my driveway to come in and help me mm -hmm. because I'm because I'm I'm coming apart. You know, I used to have an uh, Irish band and, and we there be four of us, four or five of us singing in there in five different parts. And when you take one of those five-part harmonies and you kind of roll it up and down like a roller coaster and everybody's staying together, you know, and I, you know what it's like? That's like a really good AA meeting. You can walk into a meeting and not feel it, and you can walk into a meeting and feel it. And when it's there, it's an energy. It makes you buzz. So I don't know really how to just, I, other, I know if you were, I was Christian, I would probably say it's the presence of God. Uh, I just call it a resonance, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, when, it's when recovery gets its groove on. I absolutely believe that the words on that page were inspired by God. I believe that Bill wrote it, but God authored it. I'm not one to believe that um, the big book is a Bible or nothing. It's just a book of instruction. Some, some drunks stay sober and they say, wow, if, wanna, if you all want to know how we did this, this is how we did it. There's no way anybody's sober the uh, four years that he was could have written this book. It's just uh, absolutely impossible. I mean, it's just mind-boggling what it is. It, it is so simple that it can take a spiritually bankrupt alcoholic of my sort that had no conception of God, uh, borderline atheist, fully agnostic to a true believer and a person that lives in the world of spirit and has uh, gone back to his... Uh, birth religion and so on and so forth and it's because of what's in this book and it's because of the 12 steps so it's, it's, it's God's way of getting the alcoholic back to his maker so to speak. I just do not believe these things, I'm just not down with this stuff, you know. That uh, the whole big book is entirely uh, 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 directly from God um, uh, through these two men, uh, Bill and Bob, and that it's gospel. You know, every word in there is uh, accurate, there's no mistakes. And uh, this, you're reading a, uh, a holy scripture. And uh, so if we start from that very fundamental uh, aspect, uh, you know, I just don't agree with that. If my house were burning down, I would get my wife, my children, my dog in this book out. If I had a million dollars in the house, I'd let it go up in flame because this, like I said, is my life. This, this text, this, this program, these 12 steps.
many people, they, they unite on the basis of strength, shared interest. Where, with the uniqueness of AA and other 12-step groups is these are people who bond together on the basis of a shared weakness. There is something they cannot do. There's nothing shameful about alcoholism, but the reality is that an alcoholic cannot drink alcohol in a way the society calls normal. I crawled into AA and they accepted me. And you know, I was very foggy and very crazy in my head when I came in. And I thought, oh my God, these people can't know what a nutball I am. <laughs> I was in a room full of nutballs, you know. For so many years, I felt like a square peg in a round hole. You know, you don't have to do anything to be acknowledged or to feel a part of. You just show up and present yourself. We are bonded together by something that we cannot do. That really was the beginning of, of religion, at least of Christianity. These were people who came together because they needed salvation. They recognized that. And they came together not because of something they had, but because of something they lacked. We get to h go hang out with the same people that we were using with, uh, the same crazy people, characters, uh, colorful characters. Uh, only now we're, uh, we're all in the same boat uh, trying to save our asses. I travel all over the country and I go to AA. And as soon as I walk in, I get that feeling like I'm right here at home. It's peaceful. It would be as like that I'm back in Dublin. Uh, if I close my eyes and listen to people sharing, and the realization that I'm in a different country or a different town is when I actually walk out of the meeting. This guy said, you know, I didn't, I didn't come into AA to save my soul. I came in to save my ass. And I was around for two years before I realized they were connected. And that, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why you hang around with AAs to hear lines like that. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm amazed that Bill Wilson could write that chapter with only three and a half years of sobriety. Uh, when I had three and a half years of sobriety, I don't think I could be trusted in somebody's home unsupervised. And here he is writing one of the, I think, one of the greatest spiritual pieces that I've read. I've read it so many times because I've been instructed to read it so many times as I express my doubts and my lack of faith in this uh, God as is suggested by uh, the big book of AA. It's, it's a rational analysis of why you can't be agnostic, why there is a God. There are lots of non-believers in AA, and some very prominent. And this, uh, you know, they all feel that the We Agnostics chapter is sort of condescending. They do not like that chapter in the big book. However, they are explicit, avid AA members as any other AA members, as long as you don't read the chapter with agnostics. And they, they are agnostics and they're atheists. And you know, who's going to argue with somebody about, you know, if they tell you I'm an atheist and I'm an AA, you're going to argue with them? There's disproportionately more non-believers amongst alcoholics than in the general population. And, and more of them tend to not be affiliated with a religious institution, not have a religious preference. In the population at large, something like, oh, maybe 12% of the population don't have a religious preference. Amongst alcoholics, it's 30%. So um, there's definitely, this is a group that's not into religion. I have no belief in God whatsoever. I have taken some very crude remarks about the atheism, and uh, I've had people tell me, you will go to hell. And uh, I said, you mean the God you believe in is going to judge me, not by um, what I've done with my life, but by what I believe in? And when they say yes, I tell them, I re if I had a God, I don't want the one you got. You know, it gets back to love and service. This is what Jesus talked about. This is uh, some basic, uh, you don't have to be, you can be an atheist and be a, uh, and be a loving, uh, uh, kind, compassionate, and uh, of service to your uh, community and to the world in general, you know. If you take God out of the equation, out of the steps, mm -hmm. um, what's left? What's, what's helping you get sober? Well, the spirit of the steps, I think, are ego deflation. Sort through your uh, core issues of uh, resentments, shame, guilt, anger, fear. Accept responsibility for your uh, shortcomings. And when you do wrong, when you, when you uh, hurt other people, uh, you, know, uh, you uh, make amends to them, say you're sorry, and you help others. And there's, uh, you can do all those things without, uh, well, I, you know, I don't want to say without God, but I guess that's what it gets down to. You can do all those things and be an atheist. You see, God doesn't make a lot of sense. And faith doesn't make a lot of sense from a scientific point of view. But from a so in, this, in a social psychological perspective of things, I mean, emotions don't make a lot of sense either. And yet we really, as human beings, we really are oftentimes completely controlled and manipulated by our own emotions. If you're really going to think about it, you realize there's a lot of things that happen with human interaction that is pretty, unex is pretty inex unexplainable. I mean, love's pretty unexplainable. And I think love is probably the closest thing that people have to a sense of God consciousness, of pure God consciousness. And maybe that's what it is. But I'm talking about when I get that feeling... You know, and I call it getting like a watermelon in your throat, and you get that feeling like you, you kind of want to cry, but you also want to just scream for joy almost, that kind of thing. Well, if that's not God consciousness, I don't know what is. The scriptural image of the Old Testament suggests we're in the image of the divine being, and that we have the potential to grow in the likeness of that divine being. That suggests that I have to let go of or stop clinging to what I think is my identity and allow for the possibility of evolution in my own being. I often use the example of an acorn. I say, what's an acorn? 
people will say it's a nut. What must it do in order to become everything that it's intended to be? I want them to get to one simple word, germinate. The word suggests, in spiritual language or theology, dying to myself. In so letting go of my identity of acornness, I allow for the possibility of the blossoming of that who I really am, not who I think I am. I think I'm an acorn, I'm really an oak tree. I've heard so many people tell somebody, turn it over to God. If you got a date in court and you turn it over to God and don't make that courtroom, tomorrow morning there's going to be a warrant out for you. I'm 33 years old. I'm in a drug treatment center in Rock Creek, Ohio. I'm at least $15,000 in credit card debt. I owe my mom about eight grand. I haven't made a trailer payment where I'm living for six months. I'm thinking I'm going to lose my job, and I knew intrinsically everything was going to be okay. I was, I was, I was free. So some people say free at last, free at last. So is that the third step? I don't know. Islam has got two meanings. One, peace. Salam, S L M. These are the root words of Islam. It is peace, and at the same time, it is also submission to the will of God. I have fallen at your feet, and you are the one that is going to lift me up. I heard a lady say one time, God won't do for me what I can do for myself. And there's too much turn it over to God. No, there should be a lot more getting off your dead butt and doing something about it. Once you, you, you turn your will and life over, you say, you know, God, I offer myself to thee, boom. After that, it's, all right, if I offer myself to thee, let's offer on, you know. In Buddhism, they talk about no self. They talk about Buddha nature, or the state of enlightenment, or the state of awakening to others. A life of service is the, the best way to live a happy life. Um, if you think, the book says, if you think you can wrestle happiness from this world, you think you can go out there, take what's yours, demand respect, and wrestle happiness, well, go ahead, do it. It didn't work for me. And maybe it works for a lot of people, but maybe that's why we've got such high rates of depression. Most forms of mental illness, I'm told, from M. Scott Peck, uh, have some form of narcissism attached to them. Depressed people are often self-absorbed always thinking about themselves. So if you can escape yourself, there's liberation there. When I work those 12 steps, which is the plan for how to live your life, how to be Christ-like or how to be a servant of others, because that's what it's all about. I'm no longer a servant of myself. I'm a servant doing God's will. I always say this to people. They say, you know, do, when they start talking about, do you know what God's will is for you? The essence of this thing basically says, I don't know where I'm going. And I don't even know if what I'm doing pleases you. And he's writing this to God. He says, but I think the fact that I want to do the right thing and that I would like to please you, pleases you. The central concept uh, that ties the Hindus together is the concept of dharma. That is duty. Now, for example, if a person is alcoholic uh, and he is a husband, and as a result, there are so many things that are falling apart in the household, then it's quite clear, uh, quite clear that he's not discharging his dharma or his duty. And if he recognizes his dharma, then he will pull out of those addictions and focus on what is the right relationship between him and his wife, between him and his children, between him and his family as a whole. You can be alcohol free, but if you're still having an affair, if you're married, or if you're treating your neighbors uh, poorly, your your children kicking your dog, I mean, you can be alcohol free, but I wouldn't call that sober. You know, people see the changes in you, you maybe don't see them. And my mom, two years ago, I'm sitting in my mom's kitchen having a coffee, and she says, she just looks at me and she says, I thank God and Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob every day for 29 years. She's so happy I'm here that I do this deal, you know. I got a life here. 
And again, my parents love me. My kids love me. My kids just love me. They think I'm the greatest dad in the world. That's amazing. That amazes me. I got a 15 year old daughter who thinks I'm the greatest dad. If you get a 15 year old kid that thinks you're a great dad, that's pretty neat. You know, they even use the word reborn here. We are reborn, uh, which is a little bit scary, that, w that word. I was born in Akron, died in Akron, I was reborn again, not to be religious or anything like that. And he tells us in the narrative of the third step, we are reborn again, and that's not with the tambourine or Hare Krishna or any of the things that people may assign that, you know, get dunked and sprinkled and all that. But we're, we're reborn, in other words, I've been given another life. And when I walk into Dr. Bob's, yeah, I can't help but get a tear in my eye of joy. Those two guys started something to save my life. They gave me something. They gave me a God, you know, a spirit that I didn't believe in when I got here. I was a full-blown atheist. There's no way there was such a thing as God. To be literally raised from the dead, I mean, that's what we were, walking dead, at least in my particular case. And, you know, it's so much more than not drinking. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it, it's un indescribably wonderful. I can't put into words what sobriety is and what this new way of life is. It's the Mecca of Alcoholics Anonymous, the bird place where it all started. I cried when I entered Dr. Bob's house. Um, I shook and I always wanted to visit Akron, Ohio. When even when I was back home in Ireland and only read about Akron, Ohio, something in my mind uh, always told me I should come here. Yo pienso que los árabes en millones van a la Meca a cumplir su cita con Alá. Y los católicos van también, el deseo es ir a Roma, al Vaticano. Y yo pienso que todos los alcohólicos del mundo es nuestro deseo venir algún día a Akron. Yo pienso que es nuestro Vaticano, es nuestra Meca. A lot of people come in and hear the word God and want to grab religion. I mean, in some ways it does appear like a religion, depending on what your definition is. I mean, the court system has said it's a religion. Uh, the defense is that um, AA is not a religious program. It has aspects of spirituality, uh, but it's not a religion per se. When a life has been so twisted by addiction, people look for any excuse they can find to keep using. There is a derogatory uh, tone to a uh, cult, uh, uh, but many of the elders, the wise people who are, are not hardliners, perfectly accept the word, and they say, cult, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter, it works. You know, you call it whatever you want. Is it a cult? Well, maybe it is. Who cares? The 12 traditions came out of experience. They weren't written to keep AA from becoming a cult, but the net effect has been to keep AA from becoming a cult. I think the 12 traditions are to the spirituality of the group, what the 12 steps are to the spirituality of the individual. First of all, most cults have charismatic leaders. AA is no charismatic leader. One of the tremendously unique things about Bill W. is his not becoming a charismatic leader. There are no experts on AA. I'm well situated to say that. Uh, in, in cults, there's sort of been a massive material wealth around some individual, around some person. There is no discipline that keeps you in. Cults, you know, keep you in or else they extrude you as some sort of an art outcast. You're a member of AA if you say that you are. You know, all that it takes to be a member is a desire to stop drinking. If you say you're not a member of AA, you know, you're okay, you're not a member of AA. You don't even have to drink. And, and so no membership rules, no, no boundaries. So cults have boundaries. You know who's in and who's out. You really don't. You know, they start out with the premise of uh, the only requirements uh, is a desire to stop drinking. This is a bait and switch tactic where they say, they suggest that's the only requirement, yet it's the fact it, that if you don't establish a relationship with a God, then you're not going to stay sober. That's the point of the program, is to find God. Whether you're male, female, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, it doesn't make a bit of difference. You know, it's absolutely fabulous. Religion doesn't make a difference. They want everybody to be chirping the same song. 
And if you express uh, criticism or question this, uh, people are less apt to uh, support you, to talk to you, to include you in, uh, in discussions. You're just not a part of the fellowship. You know, we don't care what you drive. We don't care if you have a shirt and tie on. We don't care if you believe in God or not. Come to AA. There's, it's been said that there's an AA meeting on every corner, and I've been to many of those corners. It really just boils down to the individuals, and every meeting will have its own personality, uh, some more dogmatic or more open to examination or what have you. But I won't know until I explore that meeting and find out how many meetings are in the area, Ex explore the, the wide view, you know, get a, get a view of the forest of recovery. I mean, there are all kinds of meetings. You can probably hear anything if you go to enough meetings. It's ridiculous when someone says, yeah, well, I went to AA and I didn't like it. It doesn't work for me. How many meetings did you go to? Two. You didn't go to AA. The reason why we use the word he is because of the difficulty we have in the language. In Arabic, the word Allah is a neutral gender. It is not he or she. Grew up in what I consider to be a pretty dysfunctional family. Authoritarian father, verbally abusive, physically abusive. By the time I was in high school, my higher power was not a male God figure. God is not gendered. Uh, my God is bigger than that. And language defines reality. You know, all of your ancient religions, whether it's American Indian, whether, you know, it's Celtic or uh, African or, you know, whatever, any of the ancient religions all had multiple gods. Krishna. Uh, declares quite clearly, he says, I am in everything, in, in every being. Just look at that elephant, look at that cow, look at that stone. God is in everything. In fact, some Hindus will say only God is. The others are just simply the apparent manifestations here and there. Mm -hmm. Only God is. You know, people question it. You know, well, why, you know, everything's God this, God that. Well, it's your concept of God. You can do whatever you want to do. I don't believe in heaven and hell. Heaven and hell are right here. We create them. Everything in this world you and I create. One plus one equals three. To me, religion and all of this is mythology, and we've created it. And that is the new frontier for me. And so I've created my spirituality that works for me, you know. And if, if, if you come to AA, you can also find your own higher power and create your spirituality. So it's really limitless. It's a matter of helping people just, as, as you said, open the synapses a little bit so that your thinking is turned just a little, like turning the kaleidoscope. You just shifted the picture. It's the same pieces there. The great wonder of creation is that God made us in his image and likeness. And ever since then, we have been recreating God in our own. And that's the mistake. So that if we're in a room full of people, we may all have our own understanding of God, but that doesn't mean we all have our own God. And that if I share my understanding with you and you share your understanding with me, we may both leave the room with a better understanding of the truth. As a result, uh, uh, I think that the 12-step programs, um, they've become a place of grace. The only job I could get was doing a wilderness trip, and I was way out of my element. It was, I was completely uncomfortable in that I was taught hardcore for 28 days that um, nature doesn't care how you feel about finding water. You learn her secrets or you, or you perish. I found that out about spirituality. There's nothing personal to me about God. I neither please or displease it. It is. And it's up to me to avail myself to the laws of that and the axioms and the disciplines, and they work without fail. We got lost somewhere along the way. And all of our problems are caused by the fact that we're lost, by the fact that we're disconnected from the source of life, 
which is God. Well, the sense of uh, having a, a purpose in my life, a meaning in my life, is much lower amongst alcoholics than it is in the general population, and that's been found in a lot of studies. Um, so there is definitely a, a spiritual struggle, I think, that's going on for alcoholics. I know for myself, my search for God was kind of mistaken or misguided because God wasn't lost. I was lost. Every human being, or for that matter, every living being, uh, has that um, spark of God called the Atman. It's like the ocean and the drop. Every droplet of the ocean has the same properties as the ocean. And uh, because that Atman resides in our cells, it is our duty. Uh, we need to keep this temple clean. I mean, the way Plato, uh, you know, said, basically, we're not our own properties. We're God's properties. And therefore, we don't have any business in destroying that. He's talking about suicide at that point, but it's, it's a very similar idea. It's, it's all your vision. It's how you pray. We don't tell people how to pray. I light candles to the four elemental powers. I have a small altar set up with bird feathers and rocks and acorns. Everybody bows their head and closes their eyes. Uh, and that's just really not my way of praying. When I pray, I, I open my eyes and I look straight up. My praying to God was telling him, I don't believe in you, this is stupid. And now I know it's for real. I do my meditation. I just get quiet, and then it just seems like I know which way to move. You know, there's times when I was like struggling to stay sober, and there were times when I was sad about a lot of stuff, and I would go for a walk. I'd go for a walk in the woods. And, they, and there's a saying that the angels walk with a man, the angels talk to a man when he walks in the woods. So prayer can be doing what I'm doing, but doing it with heightened consciousness, whether I'm teaching, or working at the till, or whether I'm washing a car. If I have the intention to be in communion with the divine, that's prayer. I said, so when does this belief turn to faith? Because I had been trying to say prayers to some god, mythical god, right? And I'd be like, make me a better golfer, or, you know, help me out. You know what I mean? It was mostly selfish stuff. Because I was still self-absorbed. How am I? How's, how am I going to get out of this thing? Help me. Whereas before, I think uh, the alcoholic by nature is so selfish, self-centered. It's always God, give me, give me, give me, like a Santa Claus or you know a little kid going to mommy or daddy. And I think a healthy relationship or my personal one is, it's not God. What can you do for me? Is what can I do for you, God? You're going to pray for potatoes. You better get a hoe. It's not what you say on your knees. It's what you do on your feet. The whole idea of these 12 steps is to have had a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience. Now, I could talk about God. I knew, I had knowledge of God from my parochial years and Bible studies and searching and things like that. But when it came time for me to be alone at 2 o'clock in the morning, I had, I was alone. I didn't, ha I didn't feel the presence. You know, a lot of people call it a void, an emptiness inside of me. But it's just a spirit that's being dormant. There is a hole in the middle of our being that we try to fill with various things. And whether it be with chemicals or with food or with the triumph of gambling or with sex or with earthly honors or with whatever, it, we, no matter how much we try to fill it, it never gets filled. This, I think, by the way, sometimes very prosperous, very successful people suddenly commit suicide and everybody wonders why. I don't have an answer, but I suspect that it's, they have all of this and that hole is still there. Everybody has different varieties of spiritual experience and we don't want to compare and we don't want to outdo each other. And a spiritual experience doesn't necessarily mean some great thing. It means a personality change sufficient to be comfortable with recovery, a shift, if you will, in consciousness.
they try to use limited words to explain this phenomenon of infinite wisdom and boundless compassion that is beyond words, beyond beliefs. How do you convey in words that which cannot be conveyed by, this is why we have artists. You know, someone supposedly legendarily asked a famous painter, you know, what does your picture mean? And he responded, if I could have told you, I wouldn't have painted the picture. And it's the, the nature of all art. I still consider myself an agnostic. Uh, the literal uh, interpretation of the word is without knowledge. I believe that there is something out there, but I don't think it's any of my business to define it. So I don't get into all that. And, and Native American way, we call it the great mystery. I'm not here to solve it. I'm not here to understand it. I'm here to just accept it. I compare God or spiritual power to electricity. You don't have to know anything about parallel circuits or pulsary circuits or uh, resistance or Ohm's law to get to experience the power of electricity. All you need to do is plug in. When man is loving his fellow man, he is instantly plugged in regardless of, uh, he doesn't even have to believe in a God, in uh, Jesus, Allah, Muhammad, Krishna, you know, any of these people to experience the power. I'm now working for God. God's now my employer, not my persecutor, not my prosecutor, not my executioner. And all these punishments that you're supposed to get from God, you work it off through community service. The 12th step is essentially what all the religious traditions would call uh, the golden rule, giving back, being in service to life. You're, you're struggling? Gee, go find somebody who's got a bigger problem than you. Go listen. All you got to do is go out there. I guarantee you there's somebody who's got nothing, you know, and you'll be like, whoo, maybe I ought to be a little grateful for what I got. I was working 11 and a half steps, and I really didn't realize how much I missed that until I went back to sponsor and, and how it completes the whole thing. And it really allows me to do my first step better, to realize how powerless I am when I see a new person, you know, struggling. Catherine has fibromyalgia, uh -huh. and so she's in chronic pain all the time. I found it's the greatest painkiller. I don't even notice that I have an illness when I'm working with other people because it's so powerful. And I'm very fond of the phrase, you may be the only big book somebody else ever gets to read. No, do we stand on street corners and preach? No. That doesn't mean we keep the light under the bushel. Sometimes people will get up and they'll, they'll slant their, their belief system on the group in their lead and things like that. But that truly isn't what AA is about. That might be that particular person. So I, I have seen that sometimes where someone might get up and lead and have a real strong uh, leaning toward, let's say, traditional Christianity. There are speakers who will come up and say, my higher power, whom I prefer to call Jesus, and no one gets up and leaves the room, or maybe someone does get up and leave the room, but the, the group goes on, the meeting goes on. I don't have a right to come in and say, good afternoon, everybody. My name's C, and I would like to thank my higher power, whom I choose to call Lucifer the Morning Star, for another day sober. It just isn't going to work. People would become very, very uncomfortable, um, would shut down, and... Recovery would the recovery process would be interrupted because that group may contain a couple of Hindus or it may contain a, contain a couple of Muslims or something who would be and especially if they were new they would be adverse to hearing about that because they would feel like they were getting religion shoved down their throat but according to the you know to our big book and to our traditions uh, it shouldn't be happening. For me, what's inspiring about the 12-step meeting rooms is to see a Jew praying with a Muslim, a pagan walking a Christian through the steps, a Hindu making a 12-step call to a Catholic, or a Baptist sharing her experience, strength, and hope with an atheist. For all their apparent differences, they are united by a common problem. And this is the story of us all. 
the story of over 6.6 .6 billion humans who live together on planet Earth. If only the world were more like an AA meeting. God, grant me the serenity. God, give me the einsicht to accept the things I cannot change. Para aceptar las cosas que no puedo cambiar. Courage to change the things I can. Le courage to change celles que je peux. And the wisdom to know the difference. Utvuna la havchin ben hashnaim. Amen. 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 Amen.